Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Research Live Finalist Showcase. Um, I'm so excited that you're here uh, to learn some new things about our students and to celebrate their research and their amazing accomplishments. Uh, so my name's Emily. I am the Director for Student Academic Development here at the Graduate College, and I'll be your MC tonight. Um, Research Live is maybe my favorite event that the Graduate College puts on every year. I think it's a really great opportunity to get to know our students, to learn more about their fascinating work, to learn how they're approaching different problems and how they're solving them and how they're just making the world honestly a better place. So tonight we are going to learn a lot of new things. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun and we're going to really celebrate the accomplishments of all of our grad students. So before we get started though, I want to welcome the Dean of the Graduate College, uh, Wojtek Hodgko Zyko, who's going to give a special welcome message. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It is also my favorite event of our academic year. What an opportunity to hear from 12 brilliant scholars that really cut across all of the disciplines in the university. So we have engineers, we have scientists, we have musicians, we have uh, theater students, and everything else in between. We have two students from one department, recreation, sport, and tourism. I think that is unfair, and we will, we will most certainly cut their uh, block grant budget if they both win. Um, but imagine this, one slide and three minutes to capture everything that you do as an intellectual and as a scholar, and to do it in a way that people from all disciplines can follow and understand. That is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, and all 12 of our finalists have mastered that. And I'm so excited to watch and listen and view all of the, the wonderful innovation and creativity that uh, embodies graduate education at University of Illinois. So thank you for being here. Uh, let's enjoy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wojtek. All right, this is a celebration. This is why we're here. We're here to learn more about our students, see their amazing work, and to celebrate. So what is a celebration without food? So there is food in the back. Um, if you need something at any point during the presentation, go back there, grab a drink, grab something to eat, um, and just sit back and enjoy. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this all works. So in February, we put out a call to all grad students across campus and asked them, we challenged them actually, to submit a three-minute talk um, using only one slide, um, and it needed to be accessible to a general audience. Um, like Boytek said, that's a really hard thing to do, um, but our students did such a great job with it. We actually had 40 uh, students accept our challenge and they submitted their videos. Um, they were evaluated actually by a round of prelim judges who um, are both faculty and staff across campus. And I actually see a lot of our prelim judges here. So could you wave your hands if you were a prelim judge? Thank you so much for all your help, yeah. <laughs> All right, and they helped us select the 12 most exemplary students, and that's who we're gonna see today. That's who we're gonna hear from today. Um, after they selected the 12 finalists, we had another round of judges who we'll hear about more in a little bit um, who helped us evaluate and uh, give out awards. Um, the criteria that they were looking at, um, you see here on this slide. Oh, can we go back a second? 
Okay, the criteria was looking at organization. How did the talk flow together? Um, did it fall in a sequence that was easily understandable and that we could follow along? Um, the purpose, did the student articulate the purpose of their work, what they're doing, how it impacts the world, how it impacts scholarship, um, and then the content. Did they explain it in a way that we can understand? Did they define any words that are unfamiliar to us? The delivery is really thinking about how they gave the talk. Um, and then finally, the visuals. What did they use to complement what they were talking about? That might be a slide, it also might be props, since you'll see quite a few of those today. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. Okay, so uh, the finals judges actually met last week, and they helped us determine some of the winners um, for, for some of these categories here. So you see we have six categories. The first award that we give out is the Visionary Award. So this is gonna be awarded to a, a student who's breaking new ground um, in their work and charting a new direction with their research. Uh, the Storyteller Award is really thinking about the presentation itself, who delivered the best presentation through their, their voice and using their you know, gestures, um, and also just the story of their work in general. Uh, the Impact Award is given to someone who is making a positive change. And the Design Award is really looking at uh, how they used slides or other materials to complement their work. And then the grand prize is the person who excelled in all of these categories. So we've already determined the winners of the first five, but the last one is something I need your help with, because I want to give one more award, um, and that's the People's Choice Award. So what we'll do is we'll watch everybody's presentation today, and then at the end, we will open up a QR code where you can vote for your favorite presentation, and then we'll give that um, person the last, <laughs> we'll give that person the last award. So the way it's gonna work today is I'm gonna call up each participant, they're gonna introduce themselves, we'll watch their video, and then I'm gonna ask them a couple questions. Um, and we'll go through all of this and then open up people's choice voting at the end. All right, so let's go ahead and get started without further ado. I guess let's first give a round of applause for all of our finalists, they did such a good job. I also kind of need to get this out of my system real quick. I feel like a game show host because I have like the cards and the microphone. So Aravind, you're the next contestant in Research Live. <laughs> Hi everyone. My name is Aravind Baby. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Material Science and Engineering and my three minutes would be about refurbishing lead acid batteries, which are used in cars. Many of us would have gone through this situation, an emergency and your car battery fails. Now you have to get it replaced. But what if I told you, you can get the same battery to work a little more, just enough so that you can get back on the road. Hi everyone, my name is Arvind Baby and I'm a fifth year PhD student from the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Today, I'm going to present a part of my research on refurbishing lead acid batteries. So lead acid batteries are conventionally recycled through a multi-step process that claim up to 3.5 million years of healthy lives lost, especially from third world population. The major mechanism by which these things fail is because of the buildup of a particular kind of insulating gunk over the battery electrode surface. So this gunk essentially covers the active material that stores the energy. So now the active material cannot be used, but it's still there. The conventional recycling strategies, they don't take this into account. What I propose here is to use a solvent to remove this gunk, expose the active material, which can be charged and discharged back again. The process here is simple. You take the failed battery, take out the electrolyte, rinse it a couple of times with water and fill in with a particular solvent. Wait for some time, replace the solvent, rinse it again, fill it with the car battery acid and voila, the battery works, you can start your car again. 
My experiments with commercial car battery electrodes have given me a capacity improvement from less than 1% to almost 99%. And as you can see from the image, the refurbished battery electrode structure, the image looks almost entirely like a new battery. Furthermore, I was able to get almost 99.9% .9 of lead from this earlier dissolved electrode gunk. The salient part about this is that I'm not releasing any lead into the environment, which means my method is extremely environmentally friendly. Now, what about the cost, you may ask? Well, the many steps involved in the conventional recycling process, they also push the price of a battery up to about 15 to 20 dollars per unit. This method cost me 10 cents per battery. Granted, I am getting only about 35% of capacity back in commercial full battery units. Well, not a lot, I agree, but that might just be enough to get you back on the road again. So that is my outlook. This may not be a, a huge step. It might be just a small step for say one car battery or one inverter battery, but this just might be that giant leap that in situ refurbishment of batteries needs. Thank you. All right, great job. Come on out here. Okay, so you, come on out, yeah. So you mentioned this gunk in your talk. Yes. Yeah, so what is the plan for the gunk? Like, what, you, what is the plan for the gunk? Does it just get thrown away? Is it something that can be reused? Like, what, what are you gonna do with the gunk? So the particular solvent that I talked about, it dissolves the gunk, and from that gunk, which contains lead, I am able to extract almost 99.9% .9 of lead from that dissolved gunk. So I'm essentially not releasing any lead into the environment. That's, that's the focus. Oh, that's cool. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, so, okay. So you submitted your prelim video in February. Yes. And then we met maybe like two weeks later, I think. March yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so when we met, I'm, I'm going to be honest, you were really frazzled. You, you were, you seemed overwhelmed. You seemed excited and stressed out. <laughs> tell, tell me what's been going on in this past month since you submitted your prelim video. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, after I submitted the prelim video, um, sometime in March, I think mid-March, uh, I was contacted by, um, the, the company Chevron, Chevron and uh, National Renewable Energy Labs in Colorado. They have a, a something called the Chevron Startup Funding Program. So um, my technology was uh, chosen as 12 finalists for that uh, startup funding. And uh, come April 29th, I might know if I am one of the five lucky people who are getting funded by that. Thank you, thank you. And I think something big happened yesterday too, right? Yeah, that, that, that what, is what that. What was it? I defended my thesis. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, guys. All right, thank you, Dr. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really still getting used to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for, for talking to me in your presentation. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, everyone. Yeah. All right, so we will go next, Satinder Kaur. Hello, everyone. So my name is Satinder, and I am a PhD student in Department of Entomology. And the title of my presentation is Flooding, Food Security, and Plant-Insect Interactions. Thank you. Imagine it rained so heavily last night that the whole city is flooded. What comes to your mind after listening to this? I am sure most of us thought about our houses blown away, our parks getting damaged and whatnot. But we forget to think about the effect of flooding on agriculture and on food security. Research has shown that flooding can lead to up to 100% of crop loss, which means no food at all. Also, the climate change is increasing the precipitation rates, which is intensifying the flooding events, 
and it is worsening the situation. But what does flooding do to the plants? Flooding restricts the movement of oxygen in the plant roots and soil, which is reducing the plant respiration, the nutrient availability to the plants, and it is decreasing the plant growth and plant productivity. Now, flooding is also changing the plant physiology and plant chemistry. Plants produce a whole lot of chemicals to defend themselves against various insect stresses, such as the insect damage. One such example is phenolic compounds, which are known to repel the insects from feeding on the plants. Now, if flooding is changing the plant physiology, it might also be changing the content of phenolic compounds, which might also changing the plant and insect interactions. So, in my study, I am understanding the effect of flooding on the maize crop, which is a very important crop of United States. We, we artificially flooded the maize crop in the field conditions and with the help of my amazing lab mates, I took some plant samples last summer and I found that the flooding decreased the shoot and root biomass and shoot length of the plants. But it increases the total phenolic content of the plants. My research will decode the reasons why flooding is uh, increasing the phenolic content of the plants and what it has to do with the plant and insect interactions. This understanding can help us in predicting some potential pest outbreaks which might occur because of flooding. In my research, uh, I am creating some fundamental knowledge about how flooding is affecting the plant growth and how it is affecting the plant defensive traits against insect herbivores. And this knowledge can translate into, uh, into reducing the crop losses which, which is occurring because of flooding and it can also translate into improving the food security. Thank you. All right, so I really loved your slide. I love the pictures you. on your slide. <laughs> and when we were talking a few weeks ago, you told me that that's your cornfield. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your cornfield. How, you, how do you have a cornfield? Oh, so we have this cornfield in the research park of university where we are growing uh, maize. And uh, it's a five acres of land and we have maize uh, grown in different plots and subplots according to their different treatments. Okay, and yeah. how often are you out in your cornfield doing things? And what do you do oh. out there? So the major field season is during summer, so May, June, and July. And we are there almost like two times a week, I would say, two days a week, yeah. And so you're studying crops, but you're also an entomologist, right? Yes. So you're studying insects as well. Yes, what are that's some of true. the insects that you see out there in your cornfield? Oh, so there are a lot of insects in the cornfield. There is one insect, it's a beetle, and it's a very shiny green colored beetle, which eats a lot of uh, silk of the corn, uh, and it causes a lot of damage. And there are some pollinators also, like honeybees, megachyle bees, and some moths also. Thank you so much <laughs> Thank you. for your presentation. Great job. So our next is Danush. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Danush, I'm a PhD student from Department of Bioengineering, and my talk is about how I use uh, origami for cancer therapy. As a kid, I was quite excited by how a boat can be made from a single piece of paper. It still excites me, but I never knew origami, a Japanese art of paper folding, would become my topic of research. But today, I'm not folding this paper, but your DNA. Is that even possible? Yes. As you can see on the top half of my slide, DNA can be folded into structures at a size which cannot be seen with your naked eye. DNA origami is often used as a molecular breadboard where you can position molecules at different distances. As a bioengineer, I was quite excited about uh, cancer therapeutics. While I was looking for features that leads to cancer in different kinds of cells, 
I found that cancer cells try to escape cell death. One of the ways in which they try to do it is by creating mutations in death-related proteins. There is a complex often referred to as wheel of death, as you can see on the bottom right, is primarily responsible for activating or amplifying signals from these death-related proteins. This complex is relatively larger in size in comparison with other death-related proteins inside the cells. And this complex has a unique geometric and then stoichiometric features that leads to activation. So what happens to this complex when they are present inside a cancer cells? They also undergo certain kinds of mutations and eventually the wheel becomes non-functional. So the cancer cells will continue to divide without dying. So by looking at all these features, I thought I can design this wheel of death using DNA. Or DNA can be folded in such a way that it looks like a star. So this star will have the same geometric and stoichiometric features as wheel of death. On top of that, a functionality can be added on top of this DNA so that it can activate all the death related proteins and trigger cell death. So once these stars are uh, delivered inside the cells, as you can see on the bottom left, we can expect the cancer cells to die. So it's kind of interesting to think uh, how I used paper-based art uh, that I used to enjoy as a kid uh, as a therapy in cancer. And uh, I find it very unique and different from other forms of therapy because of its ability to activate a pathway that was lost because of cancer. So that's all from me today. Thank you so much, guys. I have to point out that there's a, there's a sign there. D for Danush, D for DNA. I love it. <laughs> so how did this line of research start? Well, uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, it all started as a fun project when a computer scientist uh, from Caltech wanted to program DNA. So he used a bunch of uh, DNA and made some funny structures out of it. And then a lot of people followed it and made a lot of funny structures. Even if you Google DNA origami now, you'll find a lot of funny structures. And this was early 2000s. But then people started realizing the potential behind biological applications, and here we are. <laughs> And how did you get interested in folding DNA? How did you hear about this? Well, uh, I was, uh, I have always been curious about nature and the complexities associated with it. So uh, the best way to understand nature is to program its complexity. So I thought uh, DNA is the way to go and here I am doing DNA folding. <laughs> That's great. Now you said when you were a kid, you were, you folded DNA for fun. Or no, you didn't fold DNA for fun. You folded paper for fun. <laughs> What, did, what is the coolest thing that you've made? I think uh, we have made, when, when it used to rain, we made a lot of boats. Oh, but that's the most okay. uh, funny thing. And, and back in India, there used to be water logging everywhere. So once we made boats, it goes all over the place. Oh, that's great. Now I have one last question. All the finals judges wanted to know where you got your shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's... It's a gift from a friend of mine, and uh, it is very special to me. The shirt is very special. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we're going to welcome Vincent up next. Hello. Uh, my name is Vincent Carlson. I'm a PhD in theater studies. Uh, my presentation is on the matter of shatter points, a new theory of literary analysis and adaptation. A shatter point in a pane of glass is a finite spot that contains a molecular imperfection, a weakness, or an imperceptible difference. If that point receives pressure, the glass will shatter into a nexus of interpretive paths, a web of cracks. When we trace the cracks back to their source, we reveal the site at which the glass shattered. Now, identifying these shatter points in a literary or theatrical text is an identification of those source 
sites of difference where the material in the theatrical text changes and opens the text, cracking into a nexus of interpretive paths. I've developed a theory of literary analysis, a theory of adaptation called shatter points. The study of shatter points is a study of what changes in the material, and when we study what changes, we're able to identify what is different in the text, the, uh, the divergences from the source material as opposed to the fidelity to the source material. Uh, when we think about adaptation, oftentimes, like a book or movie adaptation, we ask, well, how close was it to the source material? Or how accurate was the adaptation? We may say, well, I liked the book better. Or I'm frustrated because the material wasn't honoring or faithful to the author's intentions. Well, ultimately, I'm not interested in how faithful something can be to its source. I want to study what is actually different in the source, because it's those sites of difference where we can see what the adapter was trying to do, either in a new context, a new medium, creating new meaning for a new audience. Uh, there are many, many adaptations of Shakespeare's text, for example. Uh, Hamlet, differences from the source text even. We look at when uh, Hamlet was first printed in its source material, it was called the Bad Quarto in comparison to what we use now because that text is considered to be bad or corrupted from the version we know now. When I say to be or not to be, you may reply, but in the source text, the first printing of Hamlet, the line was to be or not to be. I, there's the point. We may critique when a movie adaptation of Hamlet is different, but those differences, rather than critiquing why a character was missing or the plot was altered, the updated text or a change in setting, I want to figure out what changes in the sourced material are important for an app adapter to enact their agenda. I'm interested in those shatter points, those points of change, those points of difference, because I think they hold the most potential. They are promise crammed with future meaning. Okay, so you have big news too. Yes. Because on Friday, yep. what happened then? Uh, I successfully uh, defended my dissertation. So. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. So you wrote and directed a version of Shakespeare's, I'm sorry. Coriolanus. There we go. Yep. Um, for the theater department here. Mm -hmm. So how does your Shatterpoints theory come into play with that? Yeah, we, did, uh, we did the production of Coriolanus, uh, Shakespeare's Coriolanus, last spring. Uh, and I wrote uh, the adaptation for the play. And one of, uh, one of the significant points uh, in the adaptation is uh, rearranging a lot of the scenes so that we create new meaning. There's a big domestic scene in the play, and then there's a big war scene in the play. And I intercut those scenes and had those characters sort of on stage at the same time, not only talking about the war, but enacting the war at the same time. So we saw, I suppose, in juxtaposition, how language surrounding war affects and is affected by uh, the reenactment of war itself. That's fascinating. Do you have a favorite Shakespeare adaptation? I love, uh, there's a, there's a, a play by, uh, a man by the name of Tom Stoppard called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And it's an adaptation of uh, two characters from Hamlet. And I liked the play so much that when I was in a, a production of Twelfth Night as an actor uh, backstage, I wrote a different play called Curio and Valentine are Pissed, which is oh. a like that production too. Interesting. So not 10 Things I Hate About You, uh, not Heath Ledger. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll save my uh, opinions on oh. those movie adaptations. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, our next is Alexandra. We'll get, we can get Vincent's real opinions on the Heath Ledger adaptations at the end of the presentation. All right, Alexandra, go for it. Hi, I'm Alexandra, PhD candidate in the Department of Special Education in the College of Education. And the title of my talk is Black Teacher Voices um, for Special Education. Imagine being a first grade student and you go without a teacher all year. 
So for that entire year, you have a plethora of substitute teachers week to week, day to day that are probably not trained or certified to teach first grade. They're unfamiliar with first grade learning standards and they're unfamiliar with you as a student. So they don't know your academic abilities, um, whether or not you have a disability, what gets you excited for learning, where you are social emotionally. And while every other first grader in America is learning how to read, you never truly get full access to the reading curriculum. By now, we have all heard of teacher shortages. It's a national issue, but it's important to note that you're more likely to experience a teacher shortage when you live in an urban or rural community, live in a black or brown community, or are a student with a disability receiving special education services. Currently, there are 7.5 mil over 7.5 million students with a disability that qualify them for special ed services. But there is a shortage of special education teachers. And last year, a survey found that 65% of public schools in America had, I guess, were had experienced a shortage of special education. And in some cases, this shortage or the vacancies in special education were double that of other subject areas. So my research takes a look at the importance of recruiting and retaining special education teachers of color. I do this by highlighting their voices. What I have found is that many of the initiatives and the strategies to recruit and retain special education teachers lack teacher voice. So we're leaving out those that actually do the work. Also, my goal, the goal of my research is not only to lessen the teacher shortage crisis, but also diversify the teacher workforce in special education. So my most recent research project, I interviewed 12 black special education, education teachers in an urban district, and I found that they absolutely love what they do. There is love and joy inside of their classroom. They are building community with their, uh, with their students and their families. They are thriving. They feel successful in what they're doing. But the way we advertise special education and education in general lacks that positivity. So it's really important to highlight their voices and use their voices to dictate the strategies that we uh, implement for recruiting and retaining. It is important to highlight their voices. Thank you. Okay, so you you mentioned to me that you were a special education teacher, yeah? What drew you to that work? Well, I come from a family of educators. Shout out to my mom, who's here and a retired teacher. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of go where you are needed most. So I think, so that's what drew me to education and then special education specifically because I wanted to help design and personalize education so that all students could be successful. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, what were some of the challenges that, that you saw in your line of work? Yeah, so as much of a passion and purpose as teaching is, it's extremely overwhelming and difficult at all times. You never quite feel like you're doing enough um, and you're kind of being pulled in all these different directions. So it's, it's a grind. Yeah, yeah. But thank you so much for all your hard work to make it better and to, to help our students. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right, Shittage. The floor is yours, sir. Hi, everyone. I'm Shitich. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at the Department of Recreation, Sport and Tourism in the College of Applied Health Sciences. Uh, whoever has come, thank you so much. Okay, what comes to your mind when you hear the word pickleball? For me as an international student, uh, the first time I heard pickleball, the first thought was, how the hell am I supposed to play ball with a pickle? And in my defense, I come from India, uh, where this is not a commonplace sport. So I had no idea this even existed. And same goes for a lot of international students. With this question in mind, I brought together a team of five international graduate students, one each from India, Sweden, China, South Korea, and Brazil. What we did was we wrote critical reflexive stories 
uh, based on two questions. One of them was how do leisure experiences change for international graduate students when they transition to the US? And the second was, how does this change affect their sense of belonging? After writing these stories, we all read through each other's stories and had several rounds of discussions over them. Within our discussions, we identified uh, three major themes coming up. Uh, one was situated safety, which was common in all, but there were conflicts in that. For example, the student from one country felt very safe here in leisure spaces, and another student felt very unsafe. Now, leisure is something which is very important based on the existing research in the sense of international students because it adds to the health and well-being as well as it adds to the sense of belonging, the connection you have to this new place. The second theme which emerged was social hierarchies. So uh, we all felt that there are several social hierarchies present in leisure spaces. Uh, there is race, there is color, there is a lot of different things which are at play in these spaces. And we have no idea because we come from a different country where these things don't exist. The third theme which emerged was availability of leisure opportunities. Um, we all felt there are a diverse set of leisure opportunities available. And what we discussed was whether this diversity made us comfortable or uncomfortable in participation. Based of all of this, we uh, finally created some implications for leisure scholars um, and educators. So, we feel that leisure educators and administration could work on a few aspects. Uh, one is uh, the aspect of safety, how crime is notified. If you could make the language much more comfortable and soothing, it would not make people scared of participation. Uh, you can educate international graduate students about the available social hierarchies in these spaces so that this hesitation can go away that uh, we have while participating. And finally, you can create inclusive, diverse, and uh, open leisure opportunities which cater to a lot of different nationalities. Thank you so much. Okay. So, tell me how you came up with this topic. How did your work start? Again, a pretty interesting story. So, uh, me and my roommate, we are both Indians. And there's something which we usually do in India that after dinner, we would go out on walks. And so both of us would, uh, every night, we would go out on walks uh, roughly around 10 p.m. And every single night, uh, there was this constant joke running between us that um, since, and, and it was because we were the only two people uh, out in the neighborhood at that time. So we would joke around with us that uh, there would be someone calling 911 in the neighborhood right now saying that there are these two Asian shady dudes walking around and they come out every night. They're, so, they're up to something no good. And so that led to the thought that there is a lot of difference in the society here. There's a lot of difference in the culture here. And a lot of things change for us as international students. What we used to do in our countries, we stopped doing it here. Or maybe start doing new things. So the question of why that happens, how that happens, and what leads to that, that kind of led to this research. That's great. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned pickleball. Yeah. And we played pickleball in Brandon's office yeah. during this. Are you planning to take up pickleball now? Ah, sure. OK. I plan to do that. OK. Um, and so you, know, you talked about how pickleball is something that was new to you yeah. um, coming from India. What is a sport that would be new to us if we went to India? something we wouldn't necessarily understand. I mean, uh, there's a sport maybe you, some of you would have heard. Uh, I see a lot of Indians in the crowd, so maybe people have heard. It's called Coco. Uh, if you translate it, uh, it would just say lost, lost, or lose, lose. Doesn't make sense. And these words are not even related to what the sport is. Uh, if you Google the word Coco and search for it in the sense of sport or game, Google will tell you it's similar to tag. Now, tag is just one small element of that sport. It's a much more complicated sport, not even close to tag. So Google is, again, like you search for any disease, it tells you you have cancer. It's the same thing. So uh, I would say Coco would compare with pickleball because you wouldn't find the exact meaning of the name. And the name doesn't connect to what the sport is. Okay. There is two teams uh, with 12 people, okay. nine people on the ground. 
there's one team, uh, and there are two innings. One, pe one, one of the teams defends, and one of the team chases them. Okay. So the tag element is just that part, that one of the teams is chasing those, those mm -hmm. people. That's it. Apart from that, no connection with tag. Okay. I think I have it. Exact same expression I had with pickleball. Should we start a league? Huh? Should we start a league? What? We start a league. Do you think we could get? Absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. After this, we're gonna yes. go play. Yeah, on the quad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Vignesh. Hello everyone, thank you for being here first of all. My name is Vignesh Srinivasa Kumar and I'm a master's student in computer science. My title of my speech is a bit of a meme, AI teaches AI to teach. You'll soon realize why. Let me set the scene. You're studying for an exam the night before, as one does. You ask ChatGPT to help you study faster, as one does. Now imagine failing the test because ChatGPT gave you the wrong answer. Wouldn't that absolutely suck? Indeed, this is the problem that my research tries to solve. Can an AI teach without making mistakes? But first, let's take a step back. What is this AI? AI is short for artificial intelligence. And ChatGPT is a type of AI called large language models, or LLMs for short. As magical as they might feel, they're not perfect. LLMs suffer from one major flaw called hallucinations. Hallucination is when an LLM makes up stuff. It starts to confidently lie. So how do you teach an AI if something is the truth or a figment of its own imagination? Traditionally, we would give it a really long list or data set of questions and answers and let the fancy math figure it out. It totally worked until it became impossible. No, seriously, ChatGPT is trained on the entire visible internet and we cannot create content faster than it can learn. So how do you teach without a textbook? How do you train without data? This is the heart of my research. We make two LLMs, a teacher AI and a student AI. The student AI is a more general jack of all trades AI like ChatGPT, for example. And the student AI has been fine tuned to ask relevant questions or provide feedback to the student AI. So now when the student AI hallucinates, the teacher AI can ask some question and the student AI realizes that it's hallucinating. Like take this example. This is an actual example from ChatGPT. So this is obviously a hallucination because Elon Musk was the CEO of Twitter in 2022. There's no way the student AI or ChatGPT could have known. So when the teacher AI asks it some relevant question, it understands that it hallucinated and comes back to re recorrect itself. I know it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> but why? Why am I spending the prime of my life overdoing some classroom metaphor. Well, turns out AI is a $41 billion industry and one of its major problem is hallucinations. So once this problem is solved, you can have the student AI obviously teach you better, but that's just the beginning. You can also ask the student AI to read through your documents, bills, receipts, and you can talk to your documents. This is revolutionary. We're on the precipice of redefining how we fundamentally interact with data. And it all began with learning how to teach. Thank you. Okay, so you, you mentioned like the AI is teaching AI to teach, right? How does the teacher learn? Great question. Obviously, you can't let another AI teach the teacher AI. Right. So what we're doing is we're trying to collect data from across the internet and some human, probably a sad person like me, would sit down and teach it. Yeah, this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. And eventually, uh, the hope is that the teacher AI learns what is right, what is wrong, or at least what to ask at least. Okay, okay. Um, so what is your best user tip for using ChatGPT or generative AI? Well, there's a research paper that goes like, Sometimes if you feel ChatGPT is not giving the right answer, just rewrite your question. And that's very much true because most of the times we assume implicitly that ChatGPT knows what we're asking about. So if you give it a little bit of context or uh, ask the question in a different method or reframe it, that gives a better answer. 
Like for example, in, even in this case, as you would have seen, it's hallucinating because we did not give it enough context. So if we gave it a little bit more information, like in this year, are you sure? Or something like that, some tips, it would understand better. Or you can ask it like, this is an actual thing that I read in a research paper recently. You can ask it saying, hey, ChatGPT, my life depends upon this. Please tell if it's right or wrong. <laughs> and it does, it works, totally. So yeah, these are some cool tips that you can uh, try it out. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. I have one more question for you though. What, so these hallucinations, mm -hmm. they're, they're fascinating. What is the craziest hallucination that you have seen? Well, obviously this was the dumbest one that I've seen. That, uh -huh. no, no doubt. But I think the weirdest or the most difficult hallucinations to solve have all cost me marks in my exam <laughs> because <laughs> they are so subtle, they are so clever that you don't realize that that is wrong in the first place. We just implicitly trust it. So that's one of the weirdest ones I've seen. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Kyle. Kyle's next. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Timmer. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And today I'll be talking, well, you'll see a video of me talking about a biomimetic scaffold to improve rotator cuff shoulder repair. When we think about the different aches and pains that plague us as we get older, shoulder pain can be a big one. And often it's the rotator cuff that's to blame. If you can think of four people in your life over the age of 60, then statistically speaking, at least one of them suffers a rotator cuff tear. Like the ACL, the rotator cuff joins soft tissue, like tendon, to hard tissue, bone. Unfortunately, also like the ACL, that interfacial region is complex and difficult for the body to heal. When you tear this interface, known as the emphesis, the body prioritizes a quick fix over true healing, patching original tissue, what we call fiber cartilage, with scar tissue that is far weaker and prone to painful inflammation. And while surgery can reattach torn tendon back onto bone, it doesn't fix that inherent flaw in the healing process. And because of that, surgeries can suffer failure rates as high as 90% for large tears. So what can we do? Well, when the body needs help, we have many forms of treatment available. Some big and external, like a cast on a broken arm. Others microscopic and internal, like a pill to cure an infection. In my research, I studied the design of biomaterials, a treatment more in between. These materials are small and designed to be implanted into an injury. We call them scaffolds because, like scaffolding in construction, they provide our workers, our cells in this case, with both physical support and general instruction on what to build and where to build it, accomplishing jobs they could never have done alone. My research thus then applies this treatment design of a scaffold biomaterial to the rotator cuff tears issue of a complex interfacial injury. I'm designing a single scaffold with different zones that all together will mimic that tendon to bone junction. One side of the scaffold is softer with elongated pores mimicking tendon structure, whereas the other side is stiffer, less elongated, and containing mineralization like that in our bones. The two sides are joined by a stabilizing jello-like material, mimicking the job of that native enthesis. So, under this design, when adult stem cells migrate to an injury from other areas of the body, they'd encounter this scaffold. Its contents and structure would instruct these cells to turn into other cells necessary for the formation of tendon, fiber cartilage, or bone, depending on where in the scaffold they end up. These transformed cells would then remodel the entire injury, scaffold and all, into brand new tissue, resulting in far superior healing to the body's quick fix default. I'm excited to continue doing this research, tailoring this recipe to help our scaffold give better instructions that are faster and clearer for the cells to understand. In addition, in the next few months, we're going to be working on putting these into rats, giving us far more information to work with. While there's still a lot of work to go before these make it into a human patient, I'm excited to push toward that as a possible future. All right, so your research focuses on the rotator cuff. Yes. Could this be applied to other things as well, like other injuries? Yeah, well? so that's a great question. And so part of this research is on making this material really specific to the rotator cuff because that will help improve and really tailor the healing toward that specific tissue. 
But for instance, that fiber cartilage in the center of the material, that's in other places of our body. We have fiber cartilage in the meniscus of our knee. We have it in the intervertebral discs in our back. So designing materials that can better create or help create this tissue can have other applications there. And then, like I mentioned in the talk, the ACL is another example of this transitional tissue from hard tissue to soft tissue. And so even though maybe this specific material is specifically you know, being tailored for that injury, there are breakthroughs that we might be able to make that can really influence or inform the help of you know, other injuries as well. That's great. And you, you mentioned specifically those 60 and older that this could benefit, but it sounds like it could benefit athletes as well. Yeah. So the rotator cuff and the ACL both have these different types of injury where some are like acute, you know, happens just like that. And some are more degenerative. They happen over long periods of time, like your construction worker who's been working for years, if not decades, moving those shoulders, getting all these loads. So the rotator cuff affects older people a lot more because it's more prone to those degenerative injuries. But both types could be really impacted by any material meant for healing. That's great. Um, and so you mentioned you're doing a lot of work in the lab, right? I've never been in a lab <laughs> on campus before. What is it like? What do you like about being there? What, what do you do in the lab? Well, you know, there are some days you love it and some days you, you don't. Um, but I think one aspect of this research that's really cool is how interdisciplinary it can be. I get to work with um, orthopedic surgeons and animal scientists in designing, you know, how this might work in surgery. I get to talk to people involved in more biological development or in chemistry on, you know, working with these cells or designing these materials. So I think that aspect of the research and how there's so many different facets to look into means that even if, say, my cells hate me or something like that, I can always look into another area of the research. And so there's always something new and cool to explore and discover. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. On which. My art. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone to come here. And I hope everyone is still awake. Uh, my name is Anvesh Bhattacharya. I'm a PhD student in the computer science department. And my talk will be uh, on the on <laughs> merging galaxies and the death of the Milky Way. Thank you. Have you ever imagined what it would be like when our home galaxy, the Milky Way, collides with our neighboring galaxy, the Andromeda? What would it look like from Earth and how would it affect the rest of the galaxy? Well, this is a particularly hard problem to figure out because this collision is expected to take place 4.5 billion years into the future. We can't study something that has not taken place yet. But we can look into the sky right now and try to find galaxies that are currently in the process of merging. Once we study them, we can reasonably estimate what will happen to our own galaxy. On the top left of the slide is a galaxy named NGC 3758. It is a merger of two galaxies and it is technically termed as a double nuclei galaxy. For contrast, on the bottom left is a typical single nuclei galaxy just like our own Milky Way. Now, NGC 3758 belongs to a larger catalogue of galaxies known as the Jimeno catalogue. This was published in 2004 and contains nearly 100 double nuclei galaxies. However, 100 is not nearly enough to conduct any sort of thorough scientific study and we need to find more. Unfortunately, double nuclei galaxies also happen to be extremely rare objects. To give you an idea of how rare it is, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a public astronomy database, contains 60 million galaxies and the Gimeno catalog only has 100 and this is a ratio less than 0.001%. So, to find these rare galaxies, I created an image processing algorithm called Gothic, which when given the image of a galaxy can reliably detect whether it's a double nuclear galaxy or not. Then I deployed this algorithm on a sample of 1 million galaxies taken from the Sloan survey, and Gothic was able to find 681 new double nuclear galaxies. Some of them are shown on the right half of the slide. Then we conducted a thorough scientific study on them and discovered something quite unsettling. 
What we found is that when galaxies merge, the rate of star formation within the galaxy decreases. Now, why is this unsettling, you might ask? The answer is that all stars within a galaxy have a finite lifetime and will eventually die off. So it is precisely the formation of new stars in a galaxy which gives it life. So in a sense, it can be said that galaxy mergers are the beginning of the end of a galaxy's life. Now, this is a grim future that awaits us in the Milky Way, but I find it very amazing that we can even figure this out sitting on Earth. As a final note, I'd like to say that I'm more of a computer scientist by training, but we computer scientists have a lot to offer to other fields such as astronomy or physics. My hope is that the astronomy community can benefit by using my algorithm Gothic and apply it to other surveys such as Galax or data from the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you. So your work is, is fascinating. It's terrifying, <laughs> but also fascinating. I see. Yeah, how did you come across this? How did you figure out that computer science and, and astronomy could merge in this way? Right, uh, to answer that question, I would like to pose a question to the audience. So I think most of us are scientists or engineers here, and all of us at some point in our childhood were interested in the stars and astronomy, right? What do you think the workplace of an astronomer looks like? Do you think they're out in the fields pointing their telescope somewhere? But turns out that's not actually the case. Most astronomers are sitting behind a computer desk uh, doing data analysis by downloading data from the internet. And so naturally, there's a lot of programming and data analysis involved in astronomy work. So I find that the intersection of computer science and astronomy is quite natural. And moreover, when I was working on this project, I realized that astronomy is not just an independent field existing in its own. It is highly related to other fields such as physics, quantum mechanics, signal processing, electronics, and I learned a lot from working in astronomy. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, so what is your proudest moment in working on this project? Uh, I think, if I have to be honest, the proudest moment was when uh, my work was recognized by the Royal Astronomical Society in London. That's the first. Wow. Congratulations. And uh, as you saw in the slide, there, there were a lot of new galaxies that I discovered. And the proudest moment for me was when I realized I'm probably the first one to see them. And nobody else knows about them. And they're like millions and billions of light years away. And yeah, this is my own nugget of information, which I keep. That is <laughs> now all of you guys know as well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite galaxy that you discovered? Right. Uh, I think my favorite galaxy will be NGC 5457. Uh, it's called the Pinwheel Galaxy. All of you should Google it. It's a galaxy which looks exactly like our Milky Way. And uh, it's very cute and pretty. That's all I'll say. What? And you said that was NG... NGC 5457. Okay. Please remember I see, it. I see phones out Googling this. I will Google it when, my, when I get home. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Julia. Hi, I'm Julia Stowell. <laughs> I'm a master's student in the School of Music studying trumpet performance and literature. And the title of my talk is Brass Ceiling Amplifying the Voices of Women in Trumpet History. Of the world's top 20 orchestras, just three out of the 122 trumpet players identify as female. That is less than 3%. I am going to explore this gender disparity and explain how my research shows that by studying the history of pioneering women trumpet players, we can advocate for a better future for women in trumpet. From an early age, girls who show an interest in studying brass instruments like the trumpet face gender biases and stereotypes. There's a pervasive belief that brass instruments are better suited for men, which is perpetuated by societal norms and historical gender roles. In my career as a trumpet player, I have learned how to become comfortable as the only woman in a room and how to deal with the circumstances which result from this. In spite of these obstacles, women trumpet players demonstrate remarkable resilience and strength in pursuing their musical passions. Many of us rely on strong support networks, including fellow musicians, teachers, and mentors. I am currently involved in two female brass mentorship organizations, both as a mentor and as mentee. I believe that we can also look to women of the past for the same support. 
One of the first women cornetists was Alice Raymond. A cornet, which I have here, is basically just a smaller version of a trumpet and was what was most commonly played during Alice's life in the 1800s. Cornetists were basically the Taylor Swifts of their time. Alice was dubbed the greatest lady cornet soloist in the world and was said to have enjoyed a reputation which may well be envied by soloists of the sterner sex. She lived during a time where women could not own property or vote, yet she fought for her right to become a world-renowned musician. I am certain that she had to work twice as hard for half as much, and that had her gender been different, she would have been known as simply the greatest cornet soloist in the world. My research is focused on telling the stories of women like Alice, because their lives and works deserve to be celebrated. My work is based on primary sources, such as newspapers, articles, and reviews, as well as historical instruments such as this one. Thanks to the Sousa archives here at the U of I, I have here Barbara Blayford's cornet. Barbara was the first chair cornetist and happened to be the only woman cornetist in the Urbana High School Band in the early 1900s. I also have here a historic con wonder mouthpiece, which is actually what Alice Raymond endorsed during her lifetime. Alice's talent was only acknowledged in context to her gender. In a newspaper article reviewing her recent performance, the author wrote, she is graceful in carriage and has a fine figure and winsome features. In reviews of her male counterparts, no comments were made about their bodies. This particularly resonates with me as I think about how every time I post a video of my playing on my professional social media pages, I have to brace myself for the creepy and uncalled for comments from men. I have several marriage proposals sitting in my Instagram DMs if anybody is looking for a husband. While we can see Alice's life as encouragement as women trumpet players, we can also see as an inspiration to do better. We must continue fighting the same fight for equality that Alice did almost 200 years ago in order to continue giving women trumpet players the support to continue breaking barriers and defying expectations. All right, so why did you choose to play the trumpet? Uh, yeah, so I came from a school where you started band in fourth grade and I actually didn't pick an instrument in fourth grade, but my best friend in fourth grade played the trumpet, and I would go to her house, and you know she wanted to do normal fourth grade things like paint our nails and watch TV and play that bop it game, um, and I begged her to teach me how to play the trumpet consistently. Uh, so yeah, I was really fun to be around, um, and that's still what I do. And I was really lucky to have a lot of teachers that believed in me and supported me. And and you mentioned Barbara Blayford's mm -hmm. trumpet, and her daughter is still in, in, in town. Yeah. So have you been able to talk to her? Yeah, uh, so Scott Schwartz uh, at the Sousa Archives, shout out Scott, um, put me in contact with the Blayfords, uh, with, and she, uh, yeah, I, uh, I hit up Scott, and I was like, do you have anything I could use for this presentation? And he also had this local connection here, so I, I sent her the link to watch tonight. Well, hello, Barbara Blayford's daughter. daughter. You're here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, okay, and so we've talked about this, but you're a Swifty. Of course. Are there any other Swifties in the room or online? <laughs> okay. Let's go. So my question now is, if, if Alice Raymond were alive, what would be her favorite Taylor Swift song? Uh, thank you for asking about this. I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think that the answer would be The Man from The Lover album. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Andrew. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Freeman. I am a first year graduate student in the College of Engineering. I'm an electrical engineer. And I will be talking about electronic pulse de icing for aircraft. Picture this. You're boarding an airplane home from Christmas break, and after 20 long minutes of waiting in the cabin, you look out the window and watch some workers spring a de-icing solution on the wings. And you think to yourself, if only there were a faster, cheaper, and more reliable method to get ice off the wings. And you'd be onto something. It is estimated that around 35 million gallons of de-icing solution is used per year in the U.S. alone, which costs more per gallon than jet fuel and requires collection and chemical wastewater treatment after collection. This chemical, propylene glycol, is actually non-toxic and is used in many products for human consumption, but in large runoff quantities, it can create an oxygen depletion in water ecosystems. Now, de-icing is necessary for a safe flight, but there is clear room for improvement in terms of time and money spent and long-term dependability. That's where our research comes in. 
with industry partners and an interdisciplinary team, including mechanical, aerospace, materials, and electrical engineers like myself, we're developing a system that allows for quick and effective airplane de-icing. With the push of a button from the airplane pilot, we take energy from the battery, pass it through an intricately controlled electrical converter, and pass it on to a specialized electrically heated pad placed on the edges of the airplane wings. Now, let's use a quick analogy to help explain the importance of that electrical converter. Imagine our battery as a massive, massive uh, water reservoir, and our water wheel is modeling the, the heated pad. Now, we can't just open the entire reservoir all at once and expect everything to go well. Instead, we need to mediate the flow of water so that when it reaches the water wheel, it's at a speed it can handle. In the same sense, our converter, shown in green here, manages the energy from the battery and passes it along to the heating material so that it heats the ice sufficiently in a proper amount of time. We are actually aiming for full wing de-icing in less than 10 seconds on the ground or in the air. There is also some other important considerations such as the weight of the system, since every ounce counts on an aircraft, and its manufacturability for market, such as how much it costs to produce. While this isn't a catch-all solution, this technology will allow for a much faster and more reliable method, saving thousands of collective dollars and hours, so that you can get home and spend those extra 20 minutes with your friends and family. All right, so Andrew, you are an electrical engineer. Yes. So what is your specific role in this project? So as I mentioned, I am a first year graduate student. I'm pretty new here. Um, my, my lab mate, hello, Nicole Stokowski. Uh, big props to her. She's actually the one who uh, made this converter and is like the main proponent of this project. And so I joined this project and my specific role in helping out in this is making sure that there's a system, a safety system in place for startup and shutdown. So if we go back to our water analogy, we can't just tell that water to start moving immediately at the speed we want it. We need to ramp up to a certain speed so that the converter itself can handle that speed. Um, and in the same sense, during shutdown, we can't just immediately stop the flow of current. We need to let it dissipate from the system. And so that's my job. I see. OK. Yeah. It's an important job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, so you know a lot about planes now. You've, yeah, you're I, intimately I can basically familiar build one. With no, you, no, wait, you no. built one? No, 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 no. no. Oh, OK. I lied. But you probably could. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. so now that you know so much about planes, do you look at planes or think about planes differently when you ride on one? Yeah, I mean, when you get on the airplane, it's not something you think about, like systems like these. They just work in the background. It's not something you will like physically see on the airplane. And so once you look at something with this much detail, uh, you really get an appreciation for how much work goes into something like this. And this applies to more than just airplanes, like even riding the bus through campus. I've started noticing how many things need to work for, for everything to go properly. Um, and so it's, it's really great. And you start to notice, for a system like this, de-icing in years past, obviously it's just people spraying on a solution onto the wings. And projects like these that take a system that takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, and simplifying it down to something that can happen in 10 seconds and use a minimal amount of energy, um, you start to look for those things around your daily lives and a lot of stuff can be improved. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, that is great. Now I'm gonna go off script for a second because I have an observation. Uh, my observation is that you have the coolest earring collection that I've ever seen. I've never seen you wear the same pair of earrings twice and I've wow. seen you like four times. Yeah. So can you tell me about the earrings you're wearing right now? I, actually, I will first tell you about the earrings I'm wearing in the clip please, here. Please, please tell Again, me. Again, shout out to Nicole who made those earrings for me um, as like a, more of an onboarding gift. Uh, uh, they're actually made out of PCBs, electrical components. Um, it's very nice, clips to your ears. Uh, but these ones I got at the Urbana Farmer's Market. Oh, yeah. great. I'll just stay there. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, it's Byron. Hello, everyone. 
I have the pleasure of going last year. My name is Byron Juma. I'm the other guy from RST Recreation Sport and Tourism. And my presentation today is on the unintended consequences of doping sanctions. Imagine yourself at the height of a career in a large corporation where everything is perfect. You're the star of the moment, poised to be the next manager. Then suddenly one morning, regulators show up and inform you that you have violated the rules and will be banned from working in your occupation for four years. Three, if you're willing to accept the ban without an appeal. But you're unsure what you did to violate the rules. Maybe it was that account you filed or a report you failed to submit. What could it be? You wonder. Then suddenly you are startled back to reality by this voice over the intercom announcing your violations and that you must leave the premises immediately. The announcer reminds everyone that interacting with you also violate the rules and if they do, they'll be banned too. As you walk down the unusually silent hallway, you hear your colleagues whisper your name in disgust. The long walk to the door turns into a walk of shame, with a dark cloud of uncertainty hanging over your head. Everyone has turned their backs on you. You are virtually alone. This is what happens to athletes who violate anti-doping rules, even if they violate them unintentionally. Through my research, I intend to highlight the unintended consequences of doping sanction and deepen our understanding on the support that sanctioned athletes need. So far, I have interviewed 10 sanctioned athletes from track and field in Kenya. In this research, I seek to answer a critical question on the support that sanctioned athletes might need and how this support might be designed, funded, and operated. This research is very critical because media report and personal accounts of athletes reveal a tumultuous period following a doping sanction. This period is characterized by feelings of confusion and betrayal. Furthermore, the World Anti-Doping Agency has a mandatory public disclosure policy in place. Athletes are outed as cheats and the ostracization and stigmatization that follows might lead to depression and in extreme cases, suicide ideation. This is against the need to protect the health of at least principle upon which the anti-doping policy is founded. Furthermore, the anti-doping policy is supposed to provide a pathway back to sport for sanctioned athletes. But despite this provision, there are no official support structures in place. Only two of the 22 organizations surveyed in 2021 had some form of support. This is a low number considering that over a thousand athletes are sanctioned every year. Due to the limited research in this area, supporting sanctioned athletes proves a significant challenge for sports organization. As such, recently, national anti-doping organizations have acknowledged this challenge, underscoring the importance and timeliness of my research. My research will have the potential of assisting policymakers in designing and implementing global anti-doping support programs. Such programs will provide sanctioned athletes with a pathway back to sport and thus ensure that they are treated fairly and most importantly with respect as human beings. Thank you. Okay, so a, a really important component of your research is talking to people, right? To, to learning um, their stories. What are some of the things that you enjoy about that? Uh, like you say, talking to people is very interesting, right? Uh, to taking over one hour talking to somebody, walking them through their experience is always very interesting. But what I find very interesting for me is the conversations that we have after the interview because when you ask them what was the interview like for them, they tell you about you being the first person that spends most of their time listening to them. They have spent almost an hour talking to you and most of this time they were just, most of the time they were only the ones who are talking. So for most of them, it is the therapeutic nature of this interview. That is what is the best thing for me when I'm talking to these athletes. Yeah, and where do you plan to go next with your work? Well, um, right now I'm in the data analysis phase and looking at how things are going. My goal would be to at least ensure that I'm in a position to advocate for the rights of athletes and see if we can do some changes, especially when it comes to anti-doping policy, more so on rehabilitation of sanctioned athletes and helping them come back to sports if they want to or retire from sports peacefully and respectfully.
That's great. And, and you mentioned just a second ago the conversations before and after the interviews. Well, Brandon, our videographer, and I had a lot of fascinating conversations with everybody during mic check. And one of the things I learned about Byron is that you are a, a gardener, a big time gardener. What are you growing this year? I I don't know if I'm a big time gardener, but one thing I know for sure is that if I was not in RST, I'll be doing gardening full time, but I don't know if I'm able to sustain that. But I like planting vegetables so much, so I plant all kinds of vegetables that you can think of, from tomatoes, green onions, uh, kales, spinach, everything. But I also do uh, exotic vegetables, so like African cabbage, the night black shade, and, and the rest. That's so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and let's give one more round of applause for our finalists. We had such a great group this year. It was fantastic to meet everyone, to learn about what they're doing. Um, so much fun. And I, I do need to brag on them. Most of these people did those talks in one take and no scripts, no nothing. So they are really, really superstars there. I see that the People's Choice Award uh, QR code is up, so please scan that, vote for your favorite, and please also stick around because we have not announced the winners yet. No one knows. I'm the only person that knows, and I'm a very good secret keeper, so you're going to want to stay to find out who won our awards. Um, there's also a lot of snacks up there. Andrea is manning the snack table, so please go get some snacks. We're going to take a quick break to give everybody a little time to do their voting the people online can do voting too um, so go get snacks we will reconvene in about a minute or two don't leave yet um, it's about to get very exciting so while we're waiting on on John's um, mad math skills uh, I want to talk a little bit about our finals judges this is another thing I love about research live is that our finals judges were a group of high school students from uni high just down the street here is anyone here or any of our finals judges here can you raise your hand I saw one come in there we go hey Thank you so much for coming and for your, your time judging. Uh, we had a blast. Uh, we had about nine students. We brought them to the graduate college. We uh, gave them sheets. As you can see, we're very seriously studying the, the rubrics and the evaluations. We fed them pizza and pretzels and all sorts of other things. Um, and we just had a great time. Um, I will say the deliberation was quite difficult. We had a lot of um, battles, no, no fist fights or anything. We kept it, we kept it calm, um, but we did have a really great time uh, evaluating our presenters and, and learning more about their work. Okay, so last call for people's choice voting. Oh, that got everybody's attention. Last call for people's choice voting. And then I'm gonna tell my secret, which is all of the winners. All right, I'm back. It's time to announce the winners. All right, so I want to welcome Wojtek back to the stage to help hand out these certificates to our winners. You can, yeah. Weren't they amazing? I told you they would be. So, in addition to all of you, we had 1,100 people vote on the People's Choice Award today. Isn't that extraordinary? The, the impact of these 12 individuals multiplied so many times. You guys, you're fantastic. You are all winners, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so the first award we are going to give out is the Visionary Award, and that award goes to Vincent Carlson. So
So Vincent, the judges were impressed with your new approach to studying and understanding adaptations, and they were eager to see how your theory could be applied in other contexts. We'll take photos at the end. So if, if all the finalists can stick around for a second at the end, uh, we'll get photos. Okay. Um, our next is the Storyteller Award, which goes to Vignesh Srinivasi Kumar. So Vignesh, the judges loved your friendly, engaging demeanor and your ability to craft a story that was woven throughout your talk. The Impact Award goes to Satinder Kaur. So Satinder, judges, the judges pointed to the impact of your work in trying to understand how different factors, including climate change, could impact the food we eat and the ecosystem that it grows in. All right, the design award. This goes to Andrew Freeman. So Andrew, the judges liked that your slide clearly showed the de-icing process that you described in your talk, and they appreciated the time that you took to create this detailed graphic. Our People's Choice Award goes to Danush Gandavadi. <laughs> and finally, our grand prize winner is Kyle Timmer. <laughs> Kyle, the judges were extremely impressed with your work. You explained your research very clearly, defined any complex term, and walked us through your process for solving this problem. Your slide allowed the audience to visualize how the scaffolding can work, and the judges saw your impact on the work, the, the impact that your work would have on older generations, but also athletes. They, most of them came from soccer practice, so sports were on the, the brain. <laughs> Um, and that your delivery style was poised, relatable, and accessible, and you made what would be a challenging topic easy to understand and share with others. So, so I want to say a final congratulations to all of our winners, and a congratulations to all of our finalists. We loved having you participate. We loved learning from you. Um, Wojtek wants to say something else, but I want to say something else first, and I have the microphone. Um, I want to give a thank you to all of the grad college staff that helped out put this event together. There's a lot of people behind the scenes making sure this ran smoothly, so I want to thank everyone in the graduate college. I want to thank everyone who came out today, whether you're here in person in the SIF um, or you're online. And now I guess I'll let Wojtek say something. I also wanted to thank everybody who was involved in the production, from the videographers, the computer people, everybody in the grad college, Emily for doing such a fantastic MC job, and the brilliant idea of having students from the University High School be the judges for this competition. I think that it really shows the um, creativity that is present in graduate education here at Illinois. So um, let's all celebrate everything. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you again for coming.